Okie dokie, can, uh, sm, uh, Panthers. Talking to so many people, I forgot who I was talking to. All right, here we go. So today, uh, Spanish exploration in the New World. Uh, these are going to be a little bit of different notes, not a whole lot of writing in them uh, on the slide. So you're going to have to write down uh, what I say as I go along. Do not write down everything I say. You'll get so lost and everything. All right, so here we go. Uh, Spanish ex exploration in the New World. Lots of blood, a lot of blood, and a lot of missed opportunities for the Spanish. So um, in 1513, we have our very first European who will uh, land and will become the United States and, and create a settlement in the United States. And in 1513, Ponce de Leon arrives sailing under the Spanish flag in present day Florida. And he establishes the oldest um, continuously inhabited settlement in the United States, St. Augustine, Florida. And there's actually what the fort looks like in St. Augustine that he helped build. And people still live there today. Now, Ponce de Leon arrives in Florida looking for one thing. In Europe, there is this myth that somewhere in the world, there is a, a spring, an underwater uh, water or underground water um, uh, reservoir that if you find it and you drink that water, you'll be forever young. You'll never get old and you'll never die. And for whatever reason, Ponce de Leon believes that this fountain of youth is in Florida. And he stops all over Florida looking for the fictional fountain of youth. He obviously never finds it. Eventually, he goes back to Spain and he dies, ironically, of old age. Uh, but he leaves behind St. Augustine, Florida, which uh, will never not be inhabited. To this day, it's still inhabited. It's the longest continuously inhabited settlement uh, in the United States from Europe. And ironically enough, Florida is now seen by a lot of old people as the fountain of youth as lots and lots of old people move to Florida to live out their last days. Eh. So there you go. 1513, first European uh, settlement is established in what will become the United States, St. Augustine, Florida. In 1519, there's another uh, explorer sailing for Spain, Hernan Cortez, who is going to sail past the Caribbean through the Gulf of Mexico and land in present day uh, Mexico. Now, here's what you got to know about Spanish explorers. This is what the Spanish are looking for. You got to, got to, got to, got to, got to, got to know this. This is like good stuff. Hint, hint, winky, winky to know. The Spanish um, colonization in the New World is all about the three G's, God, gold, and glory. So here's what they mean. God, um, this currently Spain, or not Spain, Europe is in the middle of the Reformation. And um, lots of churches have broken away from the Catholic Church and, and creating new Protestant churches all throughout Europe. You have the Lutherans and you have the, oh, the, um, oh, I can't remember the people up in, in Sweden and so on and so forth. So there's all these new churches being established all over Europe. And it's threatening the Catholic Church, or at least the Catholic Church think it's thinks it's threatening it. It's losing power. It's losing money. It's losing prestige. It's losing people. So Spain remains a Catholic nation. And so Spain uh, begins to see the new world as an opportunity to expand the power and the wealth and the size of the Catholic Church. So a lot of Spanish come over here with the intent of converting the American Indians to Catholicism, bringing them to God. So that's the God. And, and there's a lot of Spanish missions set up. A lot of Spanish monks will be will come over on expeditions with, it, with the intent of uh, Christianizing the American Indians. Gold. That's pretty self-explanatory. Gold was the currency of Europe. If you had gold, you had money. If you had money, you had power. If you had power, you could get gold. If you had gold, you had money. No, 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 no. So Spain is hoping to find 
a lot of gold in a new world so it can enrich its new country and put it on equal footing with Spain or with uh, France and England. And then glory. Here's what glory means. In Spain, in order to move up the social ladder, you had to have land. The more land you owned, the more prestige you had in Spanish society. Now, in uh, Spain, unless you were a firstborn son, you weren't going to get a lot of land because there wasn't a lot of land available for mid-level or low-level noblemen to get. Most of the land had been claimed. So unless you were a firstborn son, you're not going to get any more land. Firstborn son would inherit all of the father's wealth, right? That's just the way inheritance laws were set up. Firstborn son gets everything. If you're the second born, third born, fourth born, whatever son, you're not going to get anything. And there is no way for these third, fourth, fifth born uh, sons who were noblemen, there was no way for them to increase their power and their wealth and their uh, prestige in Spain because there was no land for them to go out and get. So they could come to the new world. They saw the new world as an opportunity to begin to grow their land holdings, which would increase their power and their prestige and their glory in Spain. And so that's what the glory piece uh, is. So in 1519, Hernan Cortez comes to present day Mexico and he's about to find a lot of gold. And there's Hernan Cortez. So Hernan Cortez and his men um, land on the beaches of Mexico, about central Mexico, where they land, and they begin marching inward through the jungle. And as they're going through the jungle, they stumble across some Aztec Indians who are out foraging in the forest and they're hunting and so on and so forth. And these Aztec Indians become enamored immediately with the Spanish. Okay. Now, in Aztec religion, they have a belief that the greatest god of all their gods, a god by the name of Quetzalcoatl, will one day come to visit them. And he's the Messiah. He will make all of the wars and all of the struggle and all of the strife and all of the hunger and all of the bad things that happen to the Aztecs. He'll make, Quetzalcoatl will make it all go away. Now, how will they know when Quetzalcoatl comes? Well, according to Aztec myth, Quetzalcoatl and his um, army, his angels, will come riding in on a great beast, and their skins will shine in the sun. Their, 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 their skins will be shiny as they ride on this great beast. Well, Hernan Cortes and the Spanish conquistadors are riding on horses. There's no horses in the New World at this time. Spanish introduced horses to North, Central, and South America. There were, before the Spanish, there weren't any horses here. So the Aztecs have never seen horses. So these are the great beasts. These are, these are these monsters that they've never seen before. And Hernan Cortes and the conquistadors, their skin shines in the sunlight because they're wearing conquistador armor. So obviously, because their skin is shiny and their skin is hard and they're riding on these uh, great beasts that they've never seen before, it's obvious. These, uh, th this Hernan Cortez and the conquistadors, this is Quetzalcoatl and his army of angels that they've heard about. And here's a painting of uh, the Aztecs coming across Hernan Cortez and the conquistadors, the image that the Aztecs saw. Immediately, the Aztecs fall to their knees, and they begin worshiping him and, and, um, and praying to him. And they eventually take Quetzalcoatl, uh, or not Quetzalcoatl, they take Hernan Cortez and the conquistadors back to their capital city, which is Apichlan, present-day Mexico City. And as Hernan Cortez and the conquistadors are riding into Tenochtitlan, they're amazed at what they see. There's gold on the side of the buildings. There's gold on roadways. The people have gold jewelry and gold um, 
uh, stitched into their clothing. I mean, it's just amazing the amount of gold that's here in Tenochtitlan. And Hernan Cortez and the conquistadors, at first they can't communicate, obviously, with the Aztecs because the Aztecs speak the Aztec language. Conquistadors speak Spanish, so they can't communicate. So it's a lot of you know, hand gestures and pointing and so on and so forth. But Hernan Cortez says he wants the gold. Well, the Aztecs think, well, of course, Quetzalcoatl can have whatever he wants. So they bring Hernan Cortez gold. And then Hernan Cortez says, wow, this is a lot of gold, but you know, it'd be better than this, more gold. And so the, the uh, Aztecs bring him more gold and more gold and more gold and more gold. To the Aztecs, gold holds no value. It's just a pretty shiny rock that, they, that happens to be all over where they live. So it has no value. They use it for ornamental purposes for beautification purposes but they they don't see any value in the in the metal and hernan cortez and the, and the spaniards are asking for more and more and more and more gold and eventually the aztecs figure out i don't think this is quetzalcoatl i don't think quetzalcoatl would want this much gold i don't think the cat that that the uh, quetzalcoatl would would be like this and so the aztecs begin trying to not give him all of their gold because they're they're beginning to figure out things are not right here. As the Aztecs begin to hold back on the gold, Hernan Cortez and the conquistadors become very brutal with the Aztecs, torturing them, killing them, imprisoning them, uh, enslaving them to bring them more and more and more gold. And the Aztec empire, the once great Aztec empire begins to succumb to Spanish um, rule as the Spanish begin to in, uh, assert themselves more and more and more in Aztec culture to get more and more gold. Now, Hernan Cortez is there for many years um, enslaving and brutalizing the, the Aztecs in, in his non-ending quest for gold. In 1540, actually in 1539, Cortez is called back to Spain. His term of service is done. He's called back to Spain. The Aztecs are happy. Yahoo! We got rid of, of uh, Cortez. Things are going to be great. Gosh, we're going to go back to the way things were. Well, the person who the Spanish send to replace Cortez, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, is worse than Cortez ever was. Coronado comes in and he wants gold. He, he has an even bigger thirst for gold. And the Aztecs come up with a plan to get rid of a Coronado and hopefully the Spanish for good. They know the Spanish love gold and, and are fascinated and enamored with gold. So the Aztecs have this myth that further north, of Tenochtitlan, way north of Tenochtitlan, there are these seven cities of gold that the entire cities, all seven cities are made of gold. And each city is grander and richer and prettier than the one before it. And one of these cities of gold has this river that's a mile wide. And they have these boats, these ships that go up and down the river, and the ships are made of gold, and the oars are made of gold. And as the oars touch the water, there's somebody on the boat who rings golden bells for each time the oars hit the water, that the king lives, his throne is made of gold, and, and you know his palace is made of gold, and the everything in these cities made of gold. Well, Coronado and the Spanish are like, yes, we got to go get this. We got to go find these cities. We got, this is amazing. We got to go get this gold. <coughs> and Coronado and the, and the, um, Coronado and the uh, conquistadors, the Spanish, leave Tenochtitlan and head north looking for these seven cities of gold. Along the way, they uh, stumble across another American Indian who's actually running away from other conquistadors and he kind of stumbles into Coronado and um, he tells Coronado because he know well if he tells Coronado that he's running away from other Spanish conquistadors who are after him Coronado will kill him 
So this Indian knows this, and this Indian knows some Spanish. So he tells Coronado that he knows where these cities of gold are. He, he's seen the cities of gold, and he can take Coronado to these cities of gold. This Indian's name is Turk. Now, what Turk is hoping for is that he can get the trust of Coronado and begin leading Coronado out into the middle of nothing. And somehow, some way, he'll be able to escape to conquistadors and go off on his merry way. So he begins leading uh, Coronado and the conquistadors further north. Along the way, as they're making their way further and further north into present-day United States, Coronado and the conquistadors run into a Spanish monk who's there converting American Indians to Catholicism. And this monk tells Coronado, he's seen these cities of gold and, and the buildings are made of gold and they glisten in the sunlight. And it's a beautiful thing to, to behold. Well, Coronado is just beside himself. Right? He can't wait to go find these cities of gold. And, they can tr and, and Turk takes them further north. And you can see the red line that's Coronado's path as he's looking for the seven cities of gold. And Turk takes him all the way up into, they go into uh, Arizona, and then New Mexico, and then Texas, and then Oklahoma. And eventually they make their way into Kansas. And Coronado keeps asking Turk, well, how much further do we have to go? And Turk would tell him, oh, not too much further. I think it's just maybe a day or so ahead. It was always a day or, or so away. Eventually, they get into the middle of Kansas, and Coronado realizes there's no seven cities of gold. He's been lied to, he's been had, and he's furious. He kills Turk, and you know, probably adding to his anger is this realization that he's in the middle of Kansas, and that's just pretty awful. That'll make anybody angry, finding yourself in the middle of Kansas. So he kills Turk. And Coronado and the conquistadors begin making their way back towards Tenochtitlan. And in their path, they destroy anything and everything in their way. They destroy Indian villages. They kill Indians. They burn crops. They're just this scorched earth policy as they get back to, um, get back to Tenochtitlan. Eventually, Coronado and the Spanish make it back to Tenochtitlan, where they just absolutely slaughter the Aztecs in their capital city. Coronado beheads, decapitates um, the uh, Aztec king, Aztec ruler, Montezuma. He takes him up to the top of one of their ceremonial pyramids that they do uh, religious services and so on and so forth on. And he takes him up there and, and decapitates. Uh, Montezuma on top of this uh, pyramid. And from that point on, the Aztec culture and the Aztec uh, people become subjugated by the Spanish. And the Spanish begin to exert their influence more and more and more and more. And the Aztecs become basically a conquered people by the Spanish conquistadors. Now, the Spanish monk that saw the cities of gold. So we're pretty sure this is what he said, because he was a man of God. Why would he lie, right? We're pretty sure that he saw Pueblos that were built by the Pueblo Indians in um, the southwestern portion of the United States and southwest New Mexico and Arizona. And the Pueblo Indians built their structures out of adobe or mud. They would make these mud huts and they would bake it in the sun so that it would take on this kind of yellowish golden appearance. And when the sun hit it, the little rocks and mica in, in, the, um, in the buildings would glisten in the sunlight. So we think this is what that monk was talking about. He actually, he didn't see obviously a city of gold. What he saw were uh, Pueblo structures, a Pueblo village off in the distance um, glistening in the sun. So as the Spanish begin to exert their influence and expand uh, their uh, colonization in the southwestern portion of the United States, they begin to um, they begin to employ a, a type of slavery of the American Indians called encomienda. And in Spain, it was illegal to have slaves. You weren't allowed to own slaves in, in Spain. 
So this was a way for the Spanish to get around that rule. There's not a lot of Spaniards in the New World at that time to go out and farm and build structures and go mine and so on and so forth. So <clears throat> they began to capture the American Indians in the American Southwest and force them essentially into slavery to go work in the fields and go work in the mines and build structures and uh, all these things that the Spanish needed. But the way the Spanish made themselves feel good about it, like they could say, well, we're not um, we're not practicing slavery is um, they they would try to convert the, the Indians into Christians. And this is, you know, fulfilling their their uh, one of their G's God. Right. They're converting these people to Christianity. They're making them uh, good Catholics and they're civilizing them or they're teaching them how to be good civilized people by going out and working in the fields and working in the mines and, and building our, our houses and so on and so forth. Um, and that's how the Spanish kind of dismissed the notion that they were enslaving the American Indians. They could say, no, we're, we're uh, Christianizing and civilizing them by doing this. Now, a lot of the times the, the Indians would just kind of go along with it and they would act out in church the way that they're supposed to act out, make the cross and kneel and sit and, and stand and all the things that they were expected to do in church. They would just kind of go through the motions to kind of humor the Spanish. And the Indians, for the most part, really didn't convert uh, all that much to Christianity. So that's a really important concept to um, to hold on to, to, to know. Encomienda, which was basically the Spanish way of enslaving the American Indians. In, in exchange for their labor, they made them Christians. So it brings us to one of the few times that the American Indians actually take on and defeat a European power. And it happens in 1608 or 1680, I'm sorry, the Pueblo Revolt, or sometimes known as Pope's Revolt. And there's a picture of Pope there. So here's what happens. Um, in going back to 1598, the Spanish influence, the Spanish colonization had reached the American uh, uh, Southwest, New Mexico, Arizona, in in that area and they defeat all of the pueblo indians that's the the big indian tribe that is there the pueblo indians and in order to get the pueblo indians to kind of follow the rules and obey the, their laws they took all of the men over who are over the age of 25 and they would chop their feet off they would chop off one foot so that the Pueblos could still work, but they didn't have two feet to run away. And that was one of the ways that they maintained control was through brutal tactics such as that. Well, um, several Pueblo leaders obviously protested this and they were thrown in jail. One of these leaders, one of these Indian chiefs that was thrown in jail for pushing back against the Spanish rule was Pope. And he was put in jail for a number of years. Eventually, Pope is released. In 1675, Pope and these other Indian leaders are released from prison because the Spanish believe they've asserted enough control that the Pueblos won't do anything crazy. Pope desperately wants to get rid of the Spanish, and Pope is extraordinarily angry with the Spanish, the way that they've treated his people um, and, and forcing them into Christianity and uh, change their names from their Native American names into Christian names. And he's just really, really angry about the destruction of the, of the Pueblo culture. So Pope begins going to all these various Indian uh, Pueblo tribes all around the area. Now, the Pueblo tribes, these individual tribes, they didn't like each other and they didn't trust each other. And they were constantly fighting with each other over territory. And um, one would get mad at the other for something and they would go and attack each other. So there's no uh, tradition of unity among the Pueblo people. But now they, they've all got a common enemy. 
even though they don't like each other, they hate the Spanish even more. And Pope is going to use that anger and that hatred of the Spanish among the Pueblo to unite all of these Pueblo tribes to stage a revolt against the Pueblos or against the Spanish. So in 1680, Pope feels like he's created enough unity among the Pueblo Indians to stage this revolution. And what they're going to do is that all of these Pueblo tribes all throughout the New Mexico region, at the same time, on the same day, would stage a revolt, will rise up and attack the Spanish. So what Pope does is he creates a series of ropes, a rope for each tribe. And in, in the rope, he puts in certain number of, of knots in each rope. And you can see him, there's a, the, in the painting of Pope there, there's a, he, he's holding that rope with those knots in it. And he sends these ropes out to all of the Pueblo tribes all throughout the region. And he tells them every morning when the sun comes up, get up and untie one of these knots. And when we get to the last knot and you untie that last knot, that's when we attack. Well, eventually the Spanish recognized, realized that all of these Pueblo tribes all have this, these lengths of rope. And every morning, all of the tribes are undoing these knots, one knot a day. And the Spanish can't figure out what's going on. So they capture a young Pueblo brave and they torture him to force him to talk. And this Pueblo brave tells them the plan. Well, eventually the Pueblo Indians find out that the Spanish now know about the attack. So Pope sends out a, a, uh, a message to all of the Pueblo tribes. We will not, we're not going to wait till we get to the last knot to attack because the, the Spanish are going to be expecting it. We'll attack at the second to last knot. When we undo that second to last knot, that's when we attack. On August 11th, 1680, they undid the second to last knot. And at that moment, sunrise on August 11th, all of the Pueblo uh, tribes in the area all at once simultaneously attacked the Spanish settlements and just annihilated them. They burned them to the ground. They slaughtered and massacred the Spanish who lived in these settlements. They set fire to the uh, all the Catholic churches. They drug out all of the Catholic monks and priests who had come in and con uh, were converting the Pueblos to Catholicism and forcing them to change their names and so on and so forth. Uh, they would drag out the uh, crosses from the churches and the missions, and they would nail the, the uh, monks and the priests to the crosses, and, and then they would, tort, you know, stab them and other things and just leave them there to die. And they drove out the Spanish. The Spanish left as a result of this revolt. And the Spanish are left alone, or the Pueblo are left alone by the Spanish for 12 years. Right there yet. They're left alone for 12 years. Eventually, what happens is because there was no sense of unity among all of the Pueblo tribes in the area, and because their common enemy was gone, this sense of unity that Pope was able to bring about among the Pueblos began to bring, break down, and the Pueblo Indians begin to fight with each other once again. And this opens up the door for the Spanish to return. And in 1692, the Spanish do return into the Pueblo region. And they brutalize and they attack and they torture the uh, Pueblo Indians and again conquer the Pueblo Indians for the second time and then forever beyond that. So this is like. The first time, this is the first time that American Indian tribe has successfully attacked and defeated a European power. And it's going to be one of the last times that happens. So here's the end result to this day. 
in the U.S. Capitol in Washington, D.C., if you get that picture in your mind of what the U.S. Capitol looks like, and then there's that big dome in the middle, that's called the rotunda. And in the rotunda, that's in the middle of the Capitol. It's the main focal point of the Capitol. Every state has two statues of important people from their nation, from their state's history in the rotunda. Every state gets to choose, choose two people to have a statue made of that, that, was, that uh, represents a, an important event or an important person in that state's history. One of the two statues for New Mexico in the rotunda is Pope. And this is the statue that you see there of Pope in um, the rotunda representing the state of New Mexico. So at this point, uh, 16, around 1680, 1690s, into the 1700s, the Spanish begin to lose more and more uh, interest. They're losing interest in the southwestern portion of the United States because the Spanish are here and the Spanish are all about one thing, gold, 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 gold. Not a lot of gold in the American Southwest, right? There's not any gold in Texas, not really any gold in New Mexico. There's not a whole lot of gold in Arizona, and there's no gold in, in Southern California. There is a lot of gold, however, in Central and South America. So that's where the Spanish really begin to focus their colonization efforts. And they really lose interest in the American Southwest. They'll maintain a few outpost military bases and uh, Spanish missions and so on and so forth in the American Southwest, but most of their focus and most of their people are going to go into Central and South America, and they really ha have very little interest in maintaining what they have in the southwestern part of the United States. Crazy thing is, had they just gone a little further north into Colorado or a little further north in uh, California to present day San Francisco. Had they just done that, they would have found a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of gold. And that may have completely changed the trajectory of American history. Instead of being um, very focused and uh, based off of the English society and English culture, the United States may today instead be based off of and very focused on Spanish culture and society. You never know. But the Spanish, for the most part, this is the end of their story in the United States. A couple of times I'll come back in uh, at various points, but for the most part, this is it for the Spanish. And now other European countries are going to take a lot of interest in what will become the United States. France, will be the first one. England will eventually show up um, and they'll be here for entirely different reasons, which is why both of those European powers tend to stay in the United States because they're not here for gold. They're here for entirely different reasons. And we're done.